This is Professor Erica Jones. I'm here to talk to you about the nursing process assessment and specifically the health assessment. Lecture two in a series of three is to dis discuss the purpose of assessment and data collection to talk about the various components and different types of a health history, describe the purpose of the nursing observation interview and the physical assessment, understand the importance of sensitivity, trust, and rapport when doing a health interview, understand what can and cannot be delegated to unlicensed assistive personnel, understand how to validate, organize, and record data, understand the guidelines to use when documenting data, and we're going to talk about how clustered patient data can identify possible problem areas and nursing diagnoses, and also how a thorough functional health pattern can uncover problems that are treatable with a nursing diagnosis. that have, were embedded in on a sample physical exam and also a music video. Watch those videos and also practice your physical assessment skills. So what's the purpose of the health assessment? Most importantly, you want to establish your nurse-patient relationship. You're going to gather data about the patient's general health status, identify your patient's strengths, identify actual and potential health problems, and it establishes a base for the nursing process. When you do your assessment, you're collecting data you're identifying cues and making inferences. You're gonna validate that data after it's been collected. And you're gonna cluster data that's related and you're gonna identify patterns which will help you develop nursing diagnoses after you use your clinical reasoning skills, um, which will then guide your patient care. Sounds complicated, but it really isn't. And once you practice this, you will get very good at assessing your patient, being able to quickly determine what their primary problems are, and then developing nursing diagnoses, nursing care plans that will help you and the rest of your team care for them. Um, also in this lecture, we talk about reporting and recording data. You're going to understand how important documentation is. It is a legal record of what you've done during your shift and a common phrase that's heard in nursing is if it's not documented it's not done. So it's important that you understand how to record your data and how to record it in a way that makes it easy for the people coming in after you to understand what's going on. To nursing care. This is the nursing assessment portion of your uh, nursing process that we're talking about today. Um, Professor Slepchuk has talked about the nursing diagnosis section in her material and it all goes together and allows you to deliver safe, competent, professional care to your patient. Uh, it is abbreviated as ADPI, which stands for Assessment, Diagnosis, Planning, Implementation, and Evaluation. And I just love PI, so I have to put pictures in. Um, the nursing assessment itself consists of three components. It involves communicating with your patient. It involves collecting data, both objective and subjective data, and then it involves analysis of that data, which is probably the most important part of your job as a nurse. Uh, nursing is not, it's so much more than collecting a bunch of facts. It's actually figuring out well, how those facts relate to your patient's problems and how you can develop a plan to care for them. This program, um, you're gonna be able to assess 
systematically and comprehensively to identify nursing and medical concerns with your patient. You're going to work hard at detecting bias, including your own bias, and determining the credibility of information sources. So therefore, if your patient's significant other is telling you, you know, the patient, say the patient drinks 16 beers a day, and the patient when you do your assessment has stigmata of liver disease, it looks like they're someone who drinks a lot, but the patient tells you, you know, I only drink a beer a day, you're gonna be the one to use your critical thinking skills to figure out is the significant other telling the truth? Is the patient telling the truth? Um, my own personal opinion when it comes to alcohol or drug abuse, everybody lies, so you just have to do the best you can and determine the credibility of your information. You're gonna be able to distinguish normal from abnormal findings, and also identify the risks for abnormal findings. So say you're interviewing a very frail 99-year-old lady in the assisted living facility, and you notice she has bruising all over her arms and her legs. And she tells you, you know, she had one fall three weeks ago. And you're looking at these bruises and you're like, this lady can't be telling me the truth because she's bruised up all over the place you know she's probably falling more than she leads on or maybe there's something else going on maybe she's got some sort of bleeding issue that causes her to bruise easily but you're going to know when you assess that woman that all that bruising is not normal and what are the risks for those abnormal findings you're going to be able to make judgments about the significance of the data distinguishing what's relevant from irrelevant data. If the unlicensed assistive personnel comes to you and says Mr. Jones' blood pressure is 140 over 80, and you know Mr. Jones is a person with hypertension and you're due to give them their antihypertensive meds, you would probably not be that concerned about that data. If the unlicensed assistive personnel comes to you and says Mr. Jones' blood pressure is 70 over 40, and he is somnolent and I can't wake him up, an alarm bell is gonna run off in your head and you're gonna say, oh, Mr. Jones is normally hypertensive and he's normally wide awake, ready for his breakfast at this time of day. I'm gonna go right now and check it out. And that's your role as a nurse using your critical thinking skills. You're gonna identify assumptions and inconsistencies, checking accuracy and reliability, and recognizing missing information. So if the unlicensed assistive personnel has put vital signs in the computer and you're reviewing them and you see that your patient's blood pressure is recorded as, you know, 72 over 43, and you just went in there and assessed that patient and they look and are feeling fine, you're gonna to go to your unlicensed, unlicensed assistive personnel and say, hey, is this data accurate? Because they don't look like someone who has a blood pressure of 70 over 40, I want you to go retake it. Or maybe take it using a manual cuff instead of the machine. That's your role as the nurse. When it comes to nursing assessment and data collection, as it relates to the nursing process, the assessment portion of your exam will set the stage for your, um, for your care for the patient. So it's gonna provide data used to determine client problems and strengths, which will lead to nursing diagnosis. The information you collect during the assessment helps you plan realistic goals and effective interventions. And as you perform your nursing actions, you're gonna continually assess and gain new information, which can lead to new diagnoses and goals. And when you evaluate the patient, you're gonna reassess the patient's response to interventions, and this will allow you to change care as needed. So for example, I take care of a patient who has a terrible lung disease and she has had a very poor functional status for some time and recently she has worked very hard and has lost some weight and has become more mobile and is now looking to gain some more independence in the facility which is fantastic that's great that the patient's improving so my role as the nurse is going to be to review her care plans and to create new ones to make sure that this patient is allowed to 
you know, maybe leave the unit on a walk once a day, or maybe uh, have a better um, assistive device so that they can use a walker instead of a wheelchair. Um, your goal as the nurse is to help your patients be as functional and as healthy as possible. So you're constantly gonna be reevaluating the patient's progress and forming new goals for them. When you're collecting data, you're gonna follow the ANA standards of practice for assessment. These can be found on page 42 in your TREES book. Nurses collect comprehensive data, which includes a risk for potential problems, a desire for a higher level of wellness, patient and family desired outcomes, spiritual beliefs and cultural values, and your patient's lifestyle. You wanna take all of these into consideration when you're forming plans for your patient. Data collection has to be relevant to the current problem and it must be organized. And there are many different forms of organization available. A lot of these are gonna depend on your facility's computer system. You know, what kind of charting they use, what kind of assessment forms are required by your facility. Um, we at SDCC use functional health patterns and there's a whole separate narrated PowerPoint talking about the functional health pattern. I urge you to print out this form and become familiar with it because you're gonna use it in clinical. As you progress along in your nursing program, you'll be using care maps for the second year, which is a much more succinct way for you to look at your patient's um, medical and nursing issues and helps with um, planning. And there are certain focused assessments that you will be doing. So say your patient's complaining, they're having nausea, they're having vomiting, you're, and you've already done your comprehensive assessment during the you know, beginning of your shift, you're gonna go back into the room and you're gonna do a focused assessment, focusing on the abdomen, checking out what's going on. Do they have bowel sounds? Have they vomited? What does it look like? And then you're gonna determine from there if you need to call somebody or if it's something that can be um, you know, that's not as serious as that. So there are different types of health assessments that you'll conduct. Um, the initial or the admission assessment oftentimes is similar to a comprehensive health assessment. It's going to be conducted upon the admission to your healthcare facility. And it, as a comprehensive assessment, it's gonna provide holistic information about the client's overall health status. This is the type of assessment you're gonna be practicing when you go to clinical. You're going to be interviewing your patient, you're gonna be asking those functional health pattern questions, you're gonna do a complete head to toe physical assessment probably conducted around the same time as doing personal care for the patient, bathing them, because that way you'll be able to do a thorough skin assessment at the same time. Um, and a comprehensive health assessment is what you really want to get good at because that's what you're going to need to do whenever you get a new patient in your facility or on your unit. Ongoing assessments are performed as needed and conducted at regular intervals to continually collect data on a patient. A focused assessment is conducted to assess a specific problem, patient with nausea and vomiting, you're gonna focus your exam on the abdomen. Emergency assessment, which is what we see going on in the picture here, is conducted to assess a specific, oh, I'm sorry, conducted to determine a life-threatening or unstable conditions. Um, so your patient all of a sudden is having difficulty breathing, you're gonna go right in there, you're gonna assess their airway, you're gonna call a provider if you need to, and ultimately if you have to call a code. Special needs assessments are specific focused assessments that provide in-depth information about a particular area of client functioning and often involves using a specially designed form. These are typically, um, you know, like 
when I would do an admission assessment on my patient, I would have to make sure I did the Braden scale because that will tell me if my patient has a risk for pressure ulcers and if I need to implement a care plan to prevent pressure ulcers. Um, there's also a CATS index of ADL scale, which tells me how, much, how good my patient is at their activities of daily living, what kind of assistance they need. A nutritional assessment, uh, you're gonna be doing a nutritional assessment for your clinical work this semester on a family friend and you're going to assess how they're eating whether they've had any weight gain or loss what's their bmi what's the condition of their skin hair and nails and it will tell you specifically how they're doing nutritionally pain assessments are done frequently in acute care and it will tell you you know how much pain your patient's having whether or not they've taken medication or whether they've had other like repositioning or massage that's been helpful and a community assessment will just be an assessment of the patient's community that they're in you know is it walkable do they have access to you know fresh fruits and vegetables um, how safe is it these are specific special needs assessments data set that specifies the information that must be collected from every patient and uses a structured assessment form to organize or cluster these data. And the answer is true. Many um, institutions have a specific like admission assessment, um, some type of uh, assessment that you must do when the patient comes into their facility. of a nursing health history are all of the following you know their name their date of birth when you know how old they are their chief complaint which is also known as the reason for seeking health care the HPI what's the history of the present illness oh you know I've had this nausea vomiting for three days you know I took some uh, my Lanta and it didn't help and here I am in the hospital um, what's the client's perception of health do they normally uh, feel healthy? Do they um, feel like they normally have enough energy to do their daily activities? What are the expectations for care? Um, do they expect to be able to be restored to their usual level of health and leave the hospital in a couple days? What's their past health history? This includes any medical problems, any um, medications, um, and any surgeries. And you're also going to ask a family health history. So do you have parents that are still living? Do you have siblings? Do they have any medical problems? You know, if they died, how did they die? Do you have any children? Um, you're going to ask social history. Are you married? Do you have a job? Do you drink or use alcohol or drugs? Um, do you smoke tobacco? If so, how much? Be specific when asking these questions. Also make sure you're non-judgmental because it's important to know this stuff for a person's health. Um, you're gonna ask about medication history and device use, and underneath the picture there, it says including herbs, any supplements or herbal medications. You wanna make sure when you're taking a medication history, you get that information as well, because it will, some of those herbal meds can interact with uh, patient's prescriptions. And it's important to do a review of systems and check your patient's functional abilities. So a review of systems is just asking specific questions about each area of health. Um, if you look at the functional health pattern, which you will in the next narrated lecture, it has a pretty specific um, set of questions that will give you a thorough review of systems. Oh, that picture was of Jens Voigt. He's a professional, now retired cyclist. And this is a quote from him. Um, early in his career, early in my career at some of my first races, I realized that attacking is just my nature. I am a person that acts instead of reacts. It's the same with a lot of things in life. If you come to a room where nobody knows anybody else, instead of having an embarrassing silence, I just break the silence and chat up the first person next to me. It's the same in cycling. I like to make things happen. And I like this quote because it really gives you a picture of what his personality is like. He's, you know, somebody that's outgoing, that's aggressive, that, you know, takes action. And you want to know when you start nursing and when you do interviews, what's your personality? How do you want to um, interview your patients? 
what are you comfortable with? It's uncomfortable to get into somebody's personal space, get right up close to them, you know, touch them, listen to them. You're going to palpate people's stomachs. You're going to do stuff that normal people out in the world aren't really comfortable doing. So make sure you practice with people that you know and you're comfortable with so that when you go see those patients, you're going to know, you know, oh, I always get embarrassed when I press on someone's belly. Um, it's important for you to understand your personality and it's important for you to figure out an interview technique that works for you. Um, not every patient is going to be uh, agreeable and pleasant. So you're also gonna, might be subjected to some, you know, cranky patients. Um, it's not uncommon for nurses to be uh, yelled at in clinical settings, especially when you're in acute care dealing with very sick patients. You know, any of you with experience in the ER or experience as EMTs know that when people are sick, they are not at their best. So you're just going to have to remember that it's a different way of viewing the world and take some time to practice and, you know, just understand what your personality is and how you are going to interview your patients. Yes or no answer from that. But if I say to somebody, can you tell me about your occupation? That's an open-ended question. Um, the patient will then tell me, well, you know, I'm, I'm a nurse. I've worked in healthcare for 20 years. I started out as an EMT and I've, you know, gradually worked through school and now here I am and I like to work in the ER because blah, blah, blah. So it's going to encourage the patient to tell you more about themselves. And this will also tell you what's important to the patient. Um, a lot of times if you just take some time to listen and practice being silent and letting your patient talk, they're going to tell you what's going on with them if you allow them to. Considerations when performing your health assessment, um, you want to think about how old the patient is and where they are in their lifespan. Um, you may find that patients who are boomers would like to be referred to as Mr. or Mrs. or Sir or Ma'am, um, whereas patients that are from a different generation are comfortable with you using their first names and you don't need to be so formal. Um, cultural considerations are important also. If you are unfamiliar with your patient's culture, take a few minutes and look it up. We have access to Google on all our devices, and it really doesn't take a long time to just briefly look up what you know the person's cultural considerations might be, if it's, especially if it's something you're completely unfamiliar with. Um, language is an issue that you will probably encounter. Um, if you have a patient who has a language barrier, make sure that you are willing to find out what translation opportunities are available in your facility. Um, again, I've used Google Translate. I had a patient who was Mandarin speaking and I really needed to do an assessment on them. Even though legally for any sort of consents or anything you need an actual translator, for my assessment purposes, I was able to use Google Translate and get a really good assessment from them and help answer some of their questions because with Google Translate, the patient can speak into the phone and you can find out what they're saying in your language. So, you know, we are really lucky to have a lot of technology available to us. Um, practice Google Translate. If you've never like pulled it up on your phone, it's pretty impressive. Um, also, you want to make sure that you're cognizant of your body language. You want to have an open posture when you're talking to your patient and make sure that you remember how important silence is when allowing your patient to talk. Um, if you ask an uncomfortable question, sometimes it's instinct to want to like fill that space with more talking. But if you allow yourself like a few seconds of silence, sometimes it will give your patient, you know, incentive to speak where they might have you know, let you speak if you just went on. 
Um, you want to make sure you let your patient know that you're going to be doing an assessment. You want to make sure the room is warm enough, that they are comfortable, that they are in a Johnny if you're going to be doing a full body assessment so you don't have to like get them undressed. Um, we talk a little bit in this lecture about gender awareness and perception. Um, make sure that you ask about pronouns. If your patient is gender nonconforming, how would you like me to address you? It really can be as simple as just asking that question and then remembering what pronouns they prefer and using them correctly. Um, please read in your TREES book, page 476 to 482, about therapeutic communication and enhancing communication with clients from another culture. Uh, is the following statement true or false? The primary source of data for the health history is the patient's significant other. And that is false. You are always, always, always going to talk to your patient if, for example, you have a language barrier and your patient's family member is there and can translate for them. Absolutely allow that. If it's part of your facility's policy, I would use that because it can be really, really helpful. But remember, legally, you will always have to get a, a legit translator in order to do any sort of consenting or uh, legal paperwork with your patient. But certainly for like interviewing or especially if your patient's having pain and they can't communicate, you want to make sure that you use um, every uh, resource that you have. But primarily, you're going to ask the patient your interview questions and take their answers as um, the health history. So when we talk about data, there are subjective data and there's objective data. Subjective is something that somebody feels. So it's a patient reported symptom. Uh, you also emotions are subjective. I just feel so sad all the time. Pain is a subjective data point, but it must be taken seriously. So you're going to use your objective data, which is vital signs, labs, um, x-rays, or radiology reports, um, all the assessment findings from your physical assessment, your patient's respiratory rate, the appearance of their body, um, you know, whatever, you know, if they're sweating, all that information you're going to gather using your senses, that's objective data. If Susie and I both go into a patient's room and we can both see that patient is sweating, that's objective data. If the patient says to us, I feel really nauseous, that is subjective data. But then if they vomit, it becomes objective. Patient, nauseous, and vomited. Objective data is observable, measurable, and it can be seen heard or felt by someone other than the person experiencing it. So for example, elevated temperature, skin moisture, vomiting. Subjective data is information perceived only by the affected person. So pain, feeling dizzy, or feeling anxious. If the patient tells me I'm feeling anxious, I have no way of validating that data. But if I then do my physical assessment and they're tacking away with a heart rate of 132, chances are good they are pretty anxious if their heart rate is that fast, unless there's something else physiologically going on. But you can use your objective data to validate the subjective data, especially with pain. So if I walk in the room, my patient's grimacing, they are holding their stomach, they're moaning, all that's objective data. And then they say to me, I'm having 10 out of 10 abdominal pain. Okay, that makes sense. The hospital who just left two weeks ago, I can go in and look at that previous admission assessment and then I can ask them if there have been any changes. You know, I can review that information with them. It makes your life so much easier having um, the patient's data on file. Um, computer aided charting, you know, your computer system can be a help or a hindrance depending on where you practice. So just make sure that you understand what's required for your um, facility when you're doing charting. And the patient's chart, if you have a place with paper charts, you can look through and it usually has some comprehensive information, their past lab values, any radiology reports, notes from different specialties, uh, usually consents and legal forms are in the chart. 
the most form should be in the patient's chart, which is the Massachusetts Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. This is a pink sheet um, that will tell you your patient's code status and what their wishes are for intubation um, should they have an emergency. Your previous um, PowerPoint, the FLIP assessment PowerPoint, it's an examination done to provide additional data. It's done in a head-to-toe, systematic fashion, should be the same way every time, just for your own learning. Um, practice doing a systematic head-to-toe physical assessment. It can provide confirmation of diagnoses or it can refute data obtained. For example, that patient who had the low blood pressure recorded who looked totally fine when you went and assessed them, that's uh, going to refute that earlier data unless he's like a physiologic anomaly. But normally patients with a low, low blood pressure, they're going to look crappy. Um, you use uh, your techniques of physical assessment to gain, to gather objective data about the patient's body. And both the health interview and the physical assessment require tact, trust, and sensitivity. Again, remember, you are invading that patient's personal space. Always, always, always take the time, smile, introduce yourself, let the patient know what's going on both before you do your assessment and during it. Um, and really practice um, how you come off to your patients. It, it may even be helpful to uh, use a mirror when you're you know, introducing yourself, make, your, make sure that you're non-threatening. Um, and remember that if your patient doesn't trust you or have some sort of a rapport for you, you're not probably gonna get the best interview from them. So you wanna make sure that they're comfortable sharing their health information with you. and cold, maybe turn up the heat in the room and get them a warm blanket before starting, you're going to explain the process to the patient. It will not be painful. I'm just going to use my hands, my stethoscope, my eyes. I'm going to look, listen, and I'm going to gently touch you during this physical exam. Um, make sure that you talk to them throughout the whole examination, explaining each, each procedure in detail. And it's helpful if your patient has normal findings, I find it's always helpful to let them know that, oh, your lungs sound very good. I'm not hearing anything unusual. If then I put my scope on their heart and I hear like an unusual heart rhythm, that's when you require tact and sensitivity. You could certainly ask your patient, have you ever had an irregular heart rate? Has anyone ever told you you had an irregular heart rate before? And they might say to you, oh yeah, you know, I have AFib and I take this medication and that medication for it. If they say no, then you're just going to be very tactful and you're going to say, okay, thank you. And you're going to move on. Um, if the patient asks you directly, are you hearing an irregular heart rate? You could say something like it sounds irregular to me but I'm a student and I'm gonna go get my clinical instructor and we'll listen together um, make sure that you don't cause any patient alarm and certainly if you're hearing something unusual you're never gonna say oh, you know you're never gonna gasp you're never gonna say oh my goodness you know your stomach sounds like you haven't eaten in weeks you want to be tactful and sensitive when you're doing your physical assessment Um, when I go see my patients in the morning, I tell them that I'm going to be back to do a full physical assessment on them. I'm not going to show up while they're eating breakfast and ask them to put their tray away while I do my assessment. Um, if they have visitors, I'm going to come back. Um, you're going to make sure the patient's as free of pain as possible. If there's an exam table, you can prepare that with a clean sheet, make sure the room is worn, provide the patient with a gown and a drape so that they feel comfortable. You're going to gather all your supplies and instruments needed. It's important that you have a pen and something to write on, um, especially because you're going to be behind a mask in the clinical facility. You want to make sure that you are all prepared so you don't have to like buzz in and out of the room if you forget stuff. Always, always, always 
pull the curtain, shut the door, provide privacy to your patient. You do not want to um, expose your patient in any way. So you've already reviewed your physical assessment flip exam. You know your techniques. You know you have a head to toe order for your assessment. If you have any doubts on your ability to do this, practice. Practice physical assessment on a friend or a relative, even if you just like have a you know stuffed animal or a dog or something, just going through doing a physical assessment. I mean, your dog's probably not going to be too agreeable, but you can try. Um, make sure that you have practiced because it's so much easier to do something if you've run through it a few times. Um, if you don't have a friend or relative in your immediate social circle, you're going to make sure you use a mask and gloves and don't, if you can, you know, you can't really social distance when you're doing an assessment though. You're going to be right up in that patient's business. Make sure neither of you have a fever. Make sure nobody's sick. Um, definitely this is an unusual time for all of us. So just use your best judgment. And don't forget, skip the genital and rectal examination. You are not going to get, you no, know, just don't do it for the purposes of this class. You're gonna practice listening to heart and lungs, you're gonna to listen to belly, you're gonna palpate, you're gonna practice percussion, you're gonna make sure you do a thorough neuro exam, assessing the patient's, the patient's pupils, assessing their um, extraocular movements, assessing their motor strength, assess their orientation, but you're not gonna do any genital or rectal exam, not necessary. So before you go in to assess, you're going to perform hand hygiene, you're going to introduce yourself, you're going to identify your patient every single time you walk into that room. Hi, my name's Erica, I'm your nurse today. Can I verify your name and date of birth? Oh, I'm Mr. John Smith, my date of birth is 7-7-11. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, you're going to do a general survey as soon as you walk in the room. When you do your physical assessment and you take a health history, there are certain things that are going to be red flags to you. Patients that have had a stroke in the past, any kind of neurologic disorder, MS, Parkinson's, any history of trauma, any rheumatologic complaints like arthritis, these patients are going to have pain, they're going to have difficulty with movement. Um, any history of pain or swelling in muscles or joints. Um, if your patient regularly exercises, that's fantastic. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that if they um, don't take any exercise, you're gonna understand that's a risk for a patient's poor health. Um, do they take in enough calcium when you do a nutritional assessment? Are they um, getting enough of their nutrients and minerals that they need? Um, do they have a poor appetite? That would be a risk factor. Um, you're gonna make sure you understand any surgical history any history of smoking, alcohol intake, or drug use. And that includes prescription pain meds. If your patient says, oh, I can't get through the day without my six milligrams of Dilaudid every four hours, that's a red flag because that patient is gonna be at high risk for um, paradoxic pain response. They're gonna be at risk for constipation. And certainly, you know, you wanna educate them about the risks of that many opioids. You're going to make nursing diagnoses. You're going to plan appropriate care for that patient. You're going to develop nursing care plans that are going to help your patient out. And you're going to evaluate the patient's response to treatment. All of this will be documented so that the next nurse coming on will be able to say, oh, I'm caring for Ms. Smith today. I know she's had a stroke in the past, so she's got a self-care deficit, and I need to make sure that I get in there and help her wash up first thing in the morning and help her eat her food because that's going to help her maintain her level of health.
So you're going to immediately, if you get some sort of critical information, you're going to give verbal reporting of that data. So for example, if you go in to see Ms. Smith and she's not waking up no matter what you do, you're going to immediately call your charge nurse, notify the provider caring for them. This is a new change. Ms. Smith is normally awake and alert and she's had a stroke in the past and I'm concerned that something critical has happened. That's an immediate response. If you're doing an initial health assessment, a comprehensive admission assessment, you're going to make sure that you enter that information into the computer or record in ink on the designated facility forms the same day the patient's admitted should be um, done as close to real time as it can be, but I know that's not realistic in today's healthcare environment. We have many competing tasks and you just have to do your documentation as accurately and as close to when it happens as possible. You're going to summarize your objective and subjective data in concise, comprehensive, and, and easily retrievable matter. I want to make sure the next shift coming on understands exactly what happened in my shift. My patient had a temperature of 101.2. You know, I notified the provider. No new orders were given. I gave Tylenol. They were down to 99 at the end of the shift. Concise, objective, there was no subjective data there, but we could say the patient was not complaining of pain and you know didn't have any burning with urination. Um, and the next shift should be able to read my note and understand what happened. Use good grammar and standard medical abbreviations. It is preferred not to abbreviate um, whenever possible, but the reality is there are a bazillion initials in healthcare and you just wanna make sure you use standard acceptable medical abbreviations. Whenever it's possible, use the patient's own words. So if your patient says to me, it feels like I have an elephant sitting on my chest, that would be a phone call because you worry about a cardiac issue with a patient complaining of that kind of pressure. And documenting, you could certainly put quotations around, it feels like I have an elephant sitting on my chest and put that in your note. Avoid non-specific terms. I use a lot of non-specific terms. Unfortunately, I say things like wonky or janky, and you know, you get a general idea what I'm talking about, but I would never put that in a medical record. So I, I often say, you know, Miss Smith looks really pooky today. Never in my medical note, it's gonna say Miss Smith is pale and weak today. Pooky is my own personal term. So make sure you avoid those terms when you're documenting and when you're giving report because what pookie means for me might mean something else to someone else. Caring for the gender non-conforming patient. Being transsexual, transgender, or gender non-conforming is a matter of diversity, is not a pathology. The expression of gender characteristics, including identities that are not stereotypically associated with one's assigned sex at birth, is a common, it's a culturally diverse human phenomenon that should not be judged as inherently pathological or negative. Become comfortable with caring for patients who are gender non-conforming. How they define their identity and about their transition goals, if any, especially if you're in acute care and they're taking hormones, you wanna make sure that those hormones get reordered so that the patient doesn't suffer any consequences. It's also important to ask patients during your social assessment if they smoke, because tobacco is a major issue in the LGBT BT transgender community and smoking poses extra risks for transgender women taking hormones. It has a much higher risk of stroke and uh, clotting disorders. So you want to make sure that you assess not only alcohol and drugs, but smoking. Well, you can just call me Erica, you know, just call me Erica. So you want to just check in and respect what pronouns the patient uses. It really can be simple as saying, what's your preferred pronoun? And then once you know their preferred pronoun, make sure that you use it. If the patient uses they, their, theirs pronouns, if you're not used to using those pronouns, practice. 
because it can be challenging. Personnel. Yet they can help with ambulation, they can help with patient hygiene, washing the patients up. Any basic care needs can be delegated, but you are still assuming responsibility that these things are done correctly, and you are responsible for validating the outcome of the UAP's tasks. So if you say, please go get me a blood pressure on Miss Smith, she's looking a little pooky today, or you could say, she's looking a little pale and weak today, please go get a blood pressure on Miss Smith and the tech comes back to you and says, I got a blood pressure of 70 over 30, you're gonna, you're gonna go, well, she does look like crap, but let me go check that. Um, before you call the provider, you're gonna go and assess that patient, especially because that's a very low blood pressure and it would be concerning in any patient. You're gonna go and check that manually. If it really is 70 over 30, do an emergency assessment, you know, try and wake up Miss Smith, see if she can, you know, speak a few words, make sure she's breathing okay, get a full set of vitals, and then you're gonna report that data. Um, you're gonna also understand what guidelines you use when documenting data. Make sure that your documentation is factual, accurate, clear, and concise, because it does become part of the legal record. It's important to understand what your facility's um, requirements are for documentation and that you follow them closely. Um, also, don't use any sort of judgmental um, words, like I would never say my patient was whiny all day, complaining of 10 out of 10 pain, you know, I gave them one Tylenol uh, PRN that was ordered and they complained that it didn't help, and you know, then, then when the doctor came on the unit, I told them, you know, patient was having pain and they said, oh, they're always pretty whiny, like you would never, ever, ever put anything like that in a legal record. And especially consider what it would look like for someone reading that note after you. A patient complained of 10 out of 10 pain, you gave one Tylenol, it didn't help, and then the doctor didn't do anything. That's a legal case waiting to happen if I ever saw one. So make sure that when you read over your notes, what happened makes sense. And that if you were that patient's family member, you would feel comfortable with the care that was provided. Documentation is a legal record of events that occurred and your response to them during the shift. We talked about if it isn't documented, it isn't done. Use objective data, avoid judgmental language like we just talked about, and you're gonna document your patient's response or feelings using quotes whenever possible. So if the pain in my toes feels like a razor blades are cutting me or I feel like an elephant is sitting on my chest, in this way, it's very accurate and clear what that patient was feeling. Quotations are always helpful if you have a situation you want clearly communicated what the patient felt. Okay, so we've progressed to functional health patterns. There is a recorded YouTube video of the functional health pattern lecture. Uh, we use this interview assessment tool. It uh, guides you through collecting data based on functional health patterns. And if you go into um, Blackboard, you're gonna find the functional health pattern uh, form under clinical documents. Print a copy of this and follow along on how to do a thorough health interview on your patient and how this interview will lead you to find out problem areas and strengths of the patient. It all fits together. You're gonna do a physical exam, you're gonna do a thorough health interview, and then it's gonna lead you right to your nursing diagnoses and your nursing care plans to care for that patient. These are some references, and thank you so much for your time and attention.